Dear students, in the previous videos and exercises you've learned quite a bit about horizontal flight performance. In other words, how well can an aircraft perform when flying at a constant altitude? Now in this video we will take the next step, aircraft performance in climbing and descending flight. So the key questions I will address are, how steep can an aircraft climb? Or how fast can an aircraft climb time-wise? Or how far can an aircraft glide, following for example an engine failure? Or what is the minimum rate of descent, resulting in the longest time before the aircraft reaches the ground? Now the examples just mentioned are all extreme scenarios, but not too long from now you will also be able to calculate the aircraft performance for typical trajectories executed every day near airports around the world. When an aircraft approaches an airport for landing, it will typically descend along a three degree glide slope with engines fully operational. Now the airline operating this aircraft must know beforehand how much fuel will be burned during the complete descent, how long it will take time-wise and at which airspeed the aircraft should fly and with which engine power setting. Now I hope this more or less summarizes the objectives of this and the coming videos. Now, Let's have a look at the two parameters we are typically interested in, the rate of climb and the climb angle. Now the airspeed vector has an angle gamma with respect to the horizon, and this angle indicates how steep the aircraft climbs. Now the vertical component of the airspeed vector, v times the sine of gamma, is the rate of climb. In other words, the speed in meters per second at which the aircraft gains altitude. Now even though these two parameters are related to each other, the condition for maximum climb angle is not the same as the condition for maximum climb rate. Now the animation you see here explains this. As you just observed, the aircraft on the right hand side reaches a higher altitude in the same amount of time because the rate of climb is larger. However, note that the climb angle of the aircraft on the left is larger than the one on the right. But since the magnitude of the airspeed vector on the right hand side is larger, the combination of v times sine of gamma is larger as well. Now when would you prefer to have a large climb angle and when would you prefer to have a large rate of climb? Now the climb angle can be very important if the aircraft has to clear a certain object. And the rate of climb is important when, for example, a commercial aircraft wants to go to cruise altitude quickly because it can fly quite efficiently at that altitude. Now, in order to start calculating the maximum climb or descent performance, we need to have the equations of motion for this situation. Now remember that we already derived the general equations of motion for two-dimensional flight based on a free body diagram and a kinetic diagram. Now let's take the equations based on these two diagrams as a starting point and apply them to our current situation. So I have two equations here with a lot of variables and I'm going to make a couple of assumptions such that we can treat climbing and descending flight. Now the first assumption I'm going to make is that we're flying along a straight line. So if you would look back at the um, airspeed vector and you would say it's going along a straight line, then you can conclude that this angle gamma is constant. Of course, in reality, you could also have an airspeed vector along a trajectory which is changing and in that case gamma is not constant. So in this second situation you might be able to pull up the aircraft and climb very rapidly uh, by changing kinetic energy for potential energy and you might get a very good climb performance in this situation but you can only use that climb performance for a limited amount of time. 
And we are now more interested in this situation where you're climbing in one specific condition for a long period of time. So if gamma is constant, then the change of gamma with time will be equal to zero. So if we look back at our equation of motion, then we can say that this term is equal to zero. Now, the second assumption I'm going to make is that we're flying steady. And what do I mean exactly with steady? With steady I mean that this v over here is a constant term. Basically I'm saying that the forces and moments acting on the aircraft are not changing over time. So this means that the change of airspeed with time is equal to zero as well. And this means that the right hand side on the first equation of, of motion also becomes zero. Now just like in the previous assumption, it would of course be possible to pull up the aircraft and reduce airspeed really rapidly and exchanging kinetic energy for potential energy and by doing so climbing very quickly. However, I'm interested in steady conditions where we can have a certain climb performance for a longer period of time. So the equations of motion have become already a lot simpler, but I'm going to make some more assumptions. And the next assumption I'm going to make is that we have a small climb angle. So I'm making the small angle approximation for the angle gamma. Now if I have a small angle, then you could state that the cosine of gamma is almost equal to one. And you can also state that the sine of gamma is approximately equal to gamma itself. So this might seem like a strange approximation because we're saying, okay, we're climbing, so why should this angle be small? Well, in fact, all aircraft when they're climbing, when I'm considering normal aircraft, usually their climb angle is smaller than 20 degrees. So just as a check, I would urge you just to take out your calculator and check for yourself what happens if I calculate the cosine and the sine of an angle of 15 degrees. So this is quite a large climb angle for a commercial aircraft. So you could also say that this is in fact 0.262 radians. Now, if I would calculate the cosine of this 15 degrees, then that's in fact the same as 0.97, almost equal to one, with only a 3% difference. If on the other hand you would calculate the sine of 15 degrees, or this 0.262 radians, you will actually find that that equals 0.258. So this is something you cannot neglect. You cannot say the sine of gamma is equal to zero, but you can say that it's almost the same as gamma itself. Now let's have a look and see what that does to our equations of motion. First of all, I can state that this term is equal to one. Now the sine gamma over here actually remains. You can make that sine of gamma or you can approximate it by gamma itself. Now the most important uh, result of this small angle approximation is that in this second equation of motion I completely remove the term gamma. Whereas in the first equation of motion the gamma term will remain whether it's either gamma or the sine of gamma. Now since it doesn't matter that much if you have sine of gamma in, equa in an equation or gamma itself, because you have the same number of variables, I'll just stick with this sine of gamma in the equation. 
Now we're almost there. I'm going to make one final assumption, and that is that I'm going to assume that the thrust vector is parallel to the airspeed vector itself. Now in most cases, the thrust vector points in the same direction of the nose of the aircraft. Angle of attack is usually relatively small. So this is a pretty fair assumption. And we can say that the cosine of alpha t, so the cosine of the thrust angle of attack, is approximately equal to 1. And we can also say that the sine of alpha t, if we assume thrust perfectly parallel to speed, will be equal to 0. So in other words, if it's parallel to the speed, there will not be a perpendicular component of the thrust vector. So this means that this term here will be equal to 1, and this term here will be equal to 0. Now, you should realize that this final assumption, if you have the specific angle at which the thrust vector is attached to the aircraft, you can leave the terms there. But for this specific derivation, I'm going to make our life as simple as possible. And you can see that a lot of terms are removed from the equation now. So let's rewrite the equations of motion. And parallel to the airspeed vector, we find that thrust minus drag minus weight sine of gamma is equal to zero. And the other equation I have perpendicular to the speed says that lift minus the weight is equal to zero. Now, at the end of the day, I'm most interested in this gamma. I want to be able to calculate the climb performance of an aircraft. So I can also rewrite this first equation and state that the sine of gamma is thrust minus drag divided by the weight. So basically, I have one equation with which I can calculate the climb angle. Now, a second equation we should not forget is that we also have lift is equal to weight. Now, like I stated um, at the start of this item, we're not just interested in the sine of gamma, but we're also interested in the rate of climb. And this is equal to the vertical component of the airspeed vector, v times the sine of gamma. So it would be nice also to have an equation with which we can calculate this term. Now we can obtain such an equation if we multiply this equation with airspeed. If you would do so, you would get that v sine of gamma is equal to t times v minus d times v divided by the weight. Now remember that thrust times velocity is in fact power available, and drag times velocity is in fact power required. So we can also state that the rate of climb is equal to power available minus power required divided by the aircraft weight. So, in fact, this states that the excess power that I have can be used to climb, rate of climb per second per unit of aircraft weight. So now I have three equations with which I can do all aircraft climb and descent performance calculations. Um, zal ik gaan we meteen verder gaan? 
Okay, so summarizing, I have three equations. One equation of motion that states that lift should be equal to weight. A second equation of motion which we can use to calculate the climb angle. And finally, a power equation which was derived from the second equation of motion from which the rate of climb can be calculated. Now please note that I made several assumptions to arrive at these simple equations. In principle, you do not have to make these assumptions, like the small angle approximation. But if you do so, it greatly simplifies the calculations and it becomes possible to calculate an analytical solution for most aircraft performance problems without really affecting the final result. If on the other hand you want to be very accurate and not make all these assumptions, then you should find a result by means of a numerical approach, or in other words, by using a computer. Now, in the next video, I will apply these equations to de demonstrate how to calculate the maximum climb angle for a specific aircraft.